So on the show today, we have Diana Winston. Diana is the Director of Mindfulness Education at UCLA Semmel Institute's Mindfulness Awareness Research Center, or MARC. Called by the LA Times, one of the nation's best known teachers of mindfulness, she has taught mindfulness since 1999 in a variety of settings, including hospitals, universities, corporations, nonprofits, and schools in the US and Asia. Diana developed the evidence based mindfulness awareness practices curriculum and the training in mindfulness facilitation, which trains mindfulness teachers worldwide. She's a founding board member of the International Mindfulness Teachers Association. So Diana, I'm really thrilled to, um, to welcome you to the podcast today. It's great to have you here, here with us. Um, and I'm really looking forward to having, having this conversation with you about uh, mindfulness and everything that you've been doing over the years. It's, you've had a, a fascinating journey, I think. Um, and I know you're going to be speaking at the Embodiment Conference later on in the year. So this is just a great opportunity for people to get to know you a little bit better in, in advance. So welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. So I wanted to start perhaps with a little bit of, of background on you just to find out a bit more about what was, what was the entry point for you of getting into mindfulness, me meditation, getting into the body? Where did this all start for you? It started um, primarily upon graduation from college, although I will say that uh, I, had a fa I grew up in a family in the 70s where there was a, quite a lot of influence of Eastern spirituality. So my, my parents at the time were very interested in whatever was popular, including some gurus and some different schools of thought. So I grew up in that, in that milieu, and, but then wasn't that interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. But after I had gone to Asia and as a college student for a kind of semester abroad studying in Thailand, also did not get into Buddhist meditation at the time, but I did go back there afterwards and found my way to India okay. where I encountered Buddhist meditation teachings. And at first I also wasn't interested, but slowly I sort of came around to it and I ended up doing a very deep dive into the mindfulness teachings, both in India and then in Thailand, back again to Thailand afterwards, and then in the U.S. and Asia, uh, back and forth U.S. and Asia. Okay, so it sounds like it was quite a long, slow process for you, but it kind of gradually, I don't know, seeped into your bones somehow, this interest in this whole area. I think so. And the moment that it really was clear to me that this was important, it was like, then I took a deep dive. So it was like this slow, like you're saying, kind of a gradual exposure. And then this moment of going, wait a minute, this is really good stuff. <laughs> I need to know more about that. And that was, I was about, you know, early 20s, 22. I think. Okay, fantastic. And I, I know that you also spent a year in, in Burma as a Buddhist nun. And I'm personally very interested in that. I, I was actually in Burma and gosh, it was the 90s. And I remember it being mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful. I know that Inlay Lake is still, I think, right up there in my list of one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. So when I saw that, I'm really curious, what drew you to, why Burma? And what, made, what was behind that decision to become a nun? I'd love to hear more about that experience. Sure, I, I was, um, so, I, so I, as I said, I started practicing in India in a Tibetan Buddhist context and got involved in um, mindfulness meditation in the US. Well, also in Thailand and then in the U.S. So I was practicing with teachers in America who were very influenced by a Burmese teacher. And so then I started studying with him. His name was Saida Upandita. That was his name. And he was this very, very uh, hardcore meditation teacher. Like he was, he did not suffer fools gladly. Let's put it that way. Like you were just, you had to be really serious with him. And he would come, I was practicing, I was doing long retreats of a couple months at a time in the United States. And then he would come and I would meditate with him for a month or two. And I just found um, his teachings to be, you know, there, there, there was something about their precision and clarity and uh, this like uncompromising value of you need to practice in order to wake up more fully in the world, in order to free your mind of greed and hatred and ignorance. And so that was the first 10 years of my practice. And then he kept saying to me, why don't you come to, to Burma and you can be a, you can ordain, you can be a nun, you can practice at my center. 
So I finally, after 10 years, said, okay, I'm going to do it. And that's when I um, went and I, I um, essentially, if you become, you can, in these countries, you can ordain for short periods of time. So people do it for like a day, a week, a month, a year, um, or a lifetime. And I decided I would do it for say six months. I ended up staying a year. And so you have to like, shave your head and give away all your possessions, which I didn't do. I just put them into storage. But I, um, I committed to this like spiritual life for that, for that uh, year with him. And how, how was that, that process? I imagine there was even having spent all that time studying with him, there was still a, a culture shock actually being there and assimilating into quite a different way of life, even as a nun. What was that like? It was enormous culture shock. You're right. Yeah, it was... Um, <laughs> It was every expectation I had was kind of not met <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a healthy way. Like I thought I was going to this place that would be like the most perfect place on the planet to practice meditation with my teacher. And it turned out things like he at that point is, was becoming very internationally known. So he was traveling around the world. He wasn't there that often. Um, the center was being constructed as I got there. So there was constant workmen and um, people, work people and um, hammering and nails and drills and like, like constant bustling activity. The weather was, as you can imagine, very, very hot. Uh, there were bugs and snakes and spiders and scorpions and centipedes and for, um, a suburban girl as I was at the time, it was quite, quite overwhelming. And I was, I was very driven because I loved this teacher and this practice so much, but I was pretty much in shock. Oh, and I was getting sick and I wasn't crazy about the food. And there were, I mean, it was very, very hard. Um, and because I was so dedicated to it, I had to figure out a way through that mess, you know, through my own mind that was lonely and scared and miserable in order to be able to practice there because there was also this tremendous value that was happening simultaneously. I was, I was, I mean, no, very few of us have this opportunity to like fully dedicate their lives to this cultivation of these qualities, to this uprooting of greed and hatred and delusion and, and, um, and so I, I learned, and I mean, I could say more if you wish, but I learned how to sort of separate out the challenges and, and focus on what was valuable over, over that time. But it took a lot of work. It was not easy. No, I would love you to say some more about that, actually, because I think this is one of the keys. It it's, feels relatively easy to do our practice when everything's perfect, when we're in a beautiful place, when... You know, the sun is shining and we're surrounded by lovely people and it's kind of easy but it's when life gets tough and certainly given the way the world is at the moment it's pretty tough and if people are wanting to continue with their practice I think there's really something to be drawn from that sense of can I still do this when it gets hard so if there is anything you can share about how you how you came through that what you learned that I think that would be really valuable to to hear that please there's many things I could say, but I'll, let me just think of a couple of things that I found to be really valuable. Um, I was uh, partially, I was resisting my experience quite significantly. It was really painful. It was noisy. It was hot. It was, I was sick. I was, and the more I would resist, the more challenging it became. Right. So the, so if I, what it required was a kind of, surrender to the experience like i can be with this i can cultivate the capacity to be with this and there was this very very kind of um important moment for me where i was so so i was talking about there's lots of snakes and spiders and bugs and giant spiders the size of dinner plates and i mean really seriously and um there was, but the mosquitoes were horrible, especially during, I was there during, you know, prior to the rainy season and the mosquitoes were terrible. And so there was this period of time where I was designing mosquito traps. Like I was supposed to be, so what you were supposed to be doing, <laughs> that's not what I was supposed to be doing. What you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be meditating all day long. You wake up in the morning, you notice your body, your breath, you stay in an in-body, embodied practice throughout the day. You walk and you use the bathroom and you're being mindful. And then you uh, 
wash your face mindfully and go and you walk to get to the dining hall to eat and you eat mindfully. And it's like this, it's essentially like a boot camp, right? You're doing 24 seven mindfulness practice all day long. And then you do sitting meditation for an hour and then walking meditation for an hour and sitting meditation. That's the day. And you don't eat after 12 noon, right? You don't eat it. Like that's it. You get two meals, <clears throat> excuse me, one at five in the morning, one at about 10 30. And then that's it no food the rest of the day. So it's very, very hardcore. Mm -hmm. And all of these things were impinging on me as I was describing this. And so there was this moment where I was getting like really frustrated with the mosquitoes. And so instead of doing all the meditation I was supposed to be doing, I was like creating mosquito traps. And so I was, I figured out this thing that if I got some lake water and put it in a bucket in my room, that the mosquitoes would land on the bucket and I could kind of cover it and take it out. And um, so we were in these little huts. You have to think about it. It's, it wasn't like jungle, jungle, but it was like scrubby, jungle, foresty. Um, so then, so I tried that and I tried like, I had holes in my walls in the, in, the, in the hut that I was in. So they didn't have screens. And so the mosquitoes would come in. So I covered that up, but then I started sweating and boiling. And then I would sometimes stand by the window at night, turn on the light and invite the mosquitoes to come get me. And they would fly towards me. I'd jump out of the way and they'd fly out the window towards the light. So um, these very were the- creative and inventive. It was I love very it. creative. And when you're meditating for a long time, you get really creative. But there was this moment <laughs> where I suddenly realized that I could do all these things and spend all my time trying to get out of this problem and design mosquito traps, but wouldn't it be better instead to have a mind that could be okay, even in the midst of the mosquitoes? Yeah. And that was like a real turning point for me where I was like, wait a minute, there's always going to be another mosquito. It doesn't matter you know, how many things I solve, there will be more. So what if I could create a mind that had this capacity to be present, to hold what was happening in a compassionate way, in a caring, compassionate way? And that was like a real turning point for me. And I would often say to myself, there's always another mosquito. There's always another mosquito, kind of to remind me. And I wanted to say like a, a little just postscript to this was that after a few months of this, I was wandering around the monastery and I found this other area that was really quiet where there didn't seem to be so many bugs. And there was this nice, beautiful hut sitting there. And I went to the teacher and I said, do you think I could move to that one? And they said, okay. And so what this quality of mind that I'm talking about is called its equanimity. It's like this even mindedness and balance that is, um, it doesn't mean passivity. It doesn't mean that I just sit there and let the mosquitoes bite me, but sometimes you have to make change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to like go and move your hut and go practice somewhere else. And I say this because right now, as you're talking about like, how do we practice in the midst of, how do we live in the midst of all this? It's like, we've got to develop these qualities of even mindedness of balance because boy, we have a lot of mosquitoes right now. The world is suffering so tremendously and there's so much happening that if we can learn to hold with a kind of openness and spaciousness and a willingness to be with that experience, but that doesn't mean passivity or apathy or giving up, right? So it's this, it's like, I think the best action comes from a place of equanimity, of balance, the wisdom that arises when we're not triggered in our fear, our reactivity, our anger, but we're coming from the centered place. So that's a kind of a long way of answering your question. Um, and of course, there were many things that happened that year. Yeah, I'm sure. But I really, I love that idea of it's kind of the, it's not passive but there is something about it's kind of meeting your experience where it is and then, and allowing that to be, and that that's okay. And, and I love this idea of there's always another mosquito because you're absolutely right. No matter how much we solve, there is always another mosquito. There's always something else. So, yeah. That's right. How does, I guess I'm curious as to having had that incredible experience for a year, um, how's that influenced your, your practice, your thinking about mindfulness now, even, even all these years later? How does, is that something you still carry with you, those experiences? Absolutely. I mean, I feel like it was a foundational period in my life that has impacted pretty much everything that's followed from it. Um, 
the, I had, as I said, I had been doing about 10 years of my own mindfulness practice prior to going there, but being there and learning to practice in this in-depth way and whatever sort of insight and transformation of mind and heart that happened during that time sort of carried forward. And a lot of times, you know, people have big experiences and they don't really know the impact. So it takes years to process something like that. But I feel like, um, I feel like the work that I do at UCLA with our Mindful Awareness Research Center, which is really an educational center, I've taught thousands and thousands of people how to meditate, is really carrying forward what I learned in that monastery and what I learned from these teachers. Because my teachers, um, I mean, it was a Buddhist context, but they didn't really say like, oh, you had to be a Buddhist to do it. They were interested in relieving suffering. And they knew that this particular tool was pretty awesome for helping people work with their minds and emotions and learn to find more and more freedom. And so what I do now, and, and, it's, and it's a part of every aspect of my life, it's, I have my own personal practice. It's, most of my friends are connected in some way to, to uh, my meditation practice, not all my um, my uh, the way I'm raising my child, the the uh, everything like his his influence or the influence of that whole mindfulness movement uh, through these those sorry those teachings from the monastery and from that time is in like we've woven into everything I do. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. And and you mentioned the work you're doing at UCLA, and I wanted to ask you about that because I know that you've done lots of research into mindfulness and I'd, I'd love for you to share with us a bit more about some of the neuroscience behind it why why does mindfulness work why does it help people so much so um just just to say our center is a research center but we're also primarily an education center and we've done about like 15 different studies but compared to some big mindfulness research centers we're pretty small we're more focused on the education and some of the studies that we have done include uh we we've done studies looking at mindfulness and its impact on insomnia um, in older adults we've done studies on mindfulness and adhd uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We've done studies on younger breast cancer survivors and how it might help increase their quality of life and uh, reduce anxiety and depression symptoms. We're currently doing a study right now for Alzheimer's caregivers. So seeing if that might help re also relieving stress, reducing anxiety, reducing burnout. Um, so we've done, we've done probably, like I said, 15 or plus studies. And and the wider field of mindfulness and 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 the, and research is quite significant but it's still very young so that's something to keep in mind that even though there's probably been five six thousand studies that's a small amount so if you were to say oh well if the um how many studies are there out there telling you that heart disease is positively impacted by exercise, you would probably find, I think it's around 60,000 studies. Mm -hmm. So you can see how new the mindfulness field is. Now the thing is, although it's been researched a mm -hmm. lot for the last yeah. 30 years, more in the last decade. So that being said, there's lots of promising and exciting results, but they need to be replicated. Right. Okay. There needs to be absolutely more, um, more and more studies done. And so, so it's, they look at all sorts of things, health measures, physical health, impact on stress, impact, in, 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 impact on inflammation, impact on our healing response, on boosting the immune system, chronic pain. The, re, the research around chronic pain and mindfulness is quite robust, that it helps people with um, a symptom reduction, but also ability to tolerate the difficulties of living with chronic pain. And so that's goes back to John Kabat-Zinn's work. I remember I heard yeah. him speak in London a few years ago and he was talking all about, the, uh, that's where I think a lot of it started. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So John Kabat-Zinn is really one of the main people who brought mindfulness, not the only one, but brought mindfulness out into these like more medical and secular contexts. Mm -hmm. And they started research, and the first research they were doing was on chronic pain and mindfulness. And their program, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR, was developed initially for that. And of course, mm -hmm. it's grown in all sorts of ways. But that's the reason there's the most research, because it's one of the earliest, it was maybe the earliest intervention created. Um, so there's, there's, there is a, 
a lot of research looking at, I mean, not a lot, but some research looking at neuro, neuroscience. And one of the early studies that I've always enjoyed um, was one where they looked at advanced meditators, people who had been meditating in caves in the Himalayas for decades, and they looked at their brain and they compared them to the people of the same age range, like, you know, like us looking into the, like a, a view, sort of like a slice. Yeah. And what they saw was that the prefrontal cortex in advanced meditators was thicker than the people who had not meditated. And this is really important because the prefrontal cortex is what we think of as the CEO of our brain, right? Yes. It's responsible for executive functioning, delayed gratification, working memory, flexible thinking, and so on. So these studies are great, except they weren't longitudinal. So we don't know if a person with a thick prefrontal cortex is attracted to meditation or it became that way because they spent 40 years meditating in a cave. Is it there's been some Yeah, exactly, exactly. And there's been some research where they've looked at novice meditators and seen minute brain changes okay. in, in, in beginners over, I think one study was 27 minutes a day of practice over eight weeks. Okay. So there's, those are, you know, those are some of the kind of classic studies that people, people are very excited about and there's more to do. We did someone at UCLA was looking at longer term meditators have more cortical folds so um, that's, that's a desirable thing to have in terms of your brain. brain complexity, essentially. Correct. Yeah. Correct. More, more connectivity and uh, more, more neurons. So um, lastly, we just published a study. I just mentioned it because it's kind of interesting. We published a study where we, uh, they looked at, the, it, was, it was connected to a video game. It was kind of bizarre, but it was a video game that's about donating and giving giving money to different organizations through the video game. And they um, had people practice meditation and wanted to see if they would be more generous. And it turned out that they were. <laughs> Those who learned the mindfulness meditation were more generous in the video game in uh, donating. So anyway, just there's so much research. It's like that compassion going out for others and the brain changing through that. I'd love to ask you a little bit more about the study you did with ADHD because I, I coach people with ADHD. So I'd love to know just what were the main findings from that? Did you find anything that the, the mindfulness was particularly helpful for those groups? Yeah, so this was, study was done with uh, Lydia Zalowska, who has written a book on um, mindfulness and ADD, and uh, it was a pilot study. So um, there are other people doing really interesting work with mm -hmm. attention, particularly someone named Amishi Jha, who's in the um, University of Miami. But uh, our study was a pilot study. We had uh, adults and adolescents, and they went through an eight-week protocol that was similar to MBSR, but designed specifically for them. And similar to our program, MAPS, Mindful Awareness Practices, that we offer through UCLA. It's a, like an equivalent in mm -hmm. some ways, not completely, to MBSR. Um, the main findings were interesting. They, they, they got pretty good findings, so much so that some of the scientists looked at the data and they said, well, what medication did you put them on? And then we said, no, it was meditation with a T, not a C. But um, one of the things that they found was that... Uh, first of all, that kids could do it. Like we weren't even sure that children who identified as ADHD would be able to do it. And they absolutely were. So that was a good thing to know. But secondly, they looked at, they did a bunch of measures looking at attention. And one of the measures is um, there's different types of attention, but one type of attention is conflict attention. So conflict attention is paying attention to one thing when you're being distracted by multiple things. And how do you do it? And typically kids or ad adults with ADHD, they don't do that very well. They just get pulled into everything. Mm -hmm. But there was a significant improvement in that particular measure of their ability to stay focused. So lots more work to do, but that's kind of like the basic territory of it. Really interesting. That's, 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 I'm definitely, I'll have to have a look a bit more into that. The work that you've done, that sounds amazing. And, a really useful thing to know with some of my with some of my clients, I think. So I also wanted to talk to you about the um, the book that you published last year, Diana, the Little Book of Being. And I just wonder what prompted you, what was what made you think it was the right time for this book, and what new is it bringing to to the world of mindfulness? Well, I'm going to go back to my time in the monastery um, a little bit to say why this book arose, but. Uh, I, 
I was, there's different ways of practicing mindfulness. And um, I mean, the short answer to your question is that I think what's been popularized in the mindfulness field is something that's very sort of, uh, it's just one aspect of how we can be mindful. So this idea that I think if, you know, if you were just to read it in a newspaper where people, someone's talking about mindfulness, you pay attention to something that's happening. Usually you're breathing, your attention wanders, you bring it back. And that's the skill we were teaching those kids in the ADD study. And it was really, really, it's a very valuable thing to do. But the fact is there's many, many ways of practicing mindfulness that are not just paying attention to something focused. So we can also practice being aware of thoughts and emotions, which is also popularized to a certain degree. Um, but what, what is not so well known in the field is the way we can practice a more expansive, broader mindfulness that is connected to something called awareness, which I, I refer to as awareness of awareness. So in other words, not only are we aware of all the things we're, we're happening, our thoughts and our emotions, our breath, the sounds, but we can also notice that which is aware of that. Mm. And this is, shows up in a lot of different uh, schools of Buddhism and Hinduism. So, in, so for people who are familiar with Advaita Vedanta, where you're asking the question, in some of the practices, you're asking the question, who is noticing or who, who is experiencing this? Um, it shows up in Tibetan Buddhist practice, Dzogchen and Mahamudra, but none of that seemed to me to have made its way into the popular culture of mindfulness. And I felt like it was a, a, a problem that there were that that there are so many ways to deepen one's practice and go and have other types of experiences. And so I call this natural awareness. And, the, and natural awareness is this wide open, spacious, somewhat effortless, effortless state of being that one can access through meditation, but also can access in life. So the interesting thing is that, that when, as I started to teach about it, so many people said to me things like, oh, well, I've had that experience. I remember as a child just sitting outside and feeling deeply connected on the dock of, of, of uh, you know, on, on, on a lake or, or being with my pet or with our children or something like this quality of awareness that you don't have to work so hard to get, but it's part of what it means to be human. And this is what I call, why I call it natural awareness. So, so many of us have had that experience of being out in nature and just this settling in and this depth of connection to ourselves. So it can arise through these more somewhat more advanced meditative practices and it can also be recognized and welcomed through just our everyday life. And so that was my intention with the book. And then the reason I mentioned the monastery at the beginning of when you asked me the question is just that I had been practicing in the, the very classical mindfulness ways of paying attention to my breathing, my attention wandered. And after a period of practice of many months, I realized that, I found myself um, just sort of burning out on that sort of effort-based practice of like practicing for a goal, do well, get your A, get your check plus in meditation. And I realized that I needed to do a much more open, spacious, relaxed practice. And so that was the start of where I began learning those practices, which later, 20 years later, <laughs> became part of my book. And that sounds wonderful because I think particularly when people first start coming, first come to mindfulness and meditation, I know this was my experience. It felt like it was really hard work. And I was like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm not doing it. And then you beat yourself up and then you leave it for a bit and you go, no, I'm going to try again. I'm like, well, I must try harder. And it kind of becomes a way of another way of, yes, of beating yourself up to so to feel that there's actually another way that doesn't have to be so, so much hard work sounds incredibly powerful and and quite i'm quite welcome actually that it doesn't have to be so difficult absolutely people can be very hard on themselves okay so it's so in in the book itself you describe quite a lot of what you call glimpse practices and i wondered if you could just share a little bit more about what those are and what's the benefit of people trying them a glimpse practice is a way to bring to access natural awareness 
in any moment. So it's something you can do while you're meditating or it's something that you can do in the midst of your day. And I call them glimpse practices to take the pressure off. Like it doesn't have to be, I have this profound meditation experience. It could just simply be like, okay, I'm going to just pause for a moment and see if I can just take a pause and connect with myself and connect with this possibility of a bit more spaciousness, a bit more ease, a bit more well-being. So I developed a number of practices. Some I got from other teachers, some I developed myself, some from my students, where, which seem to help people to access this quality of natural awareness that, that I've been talking about that I think is inherent in all people. And so if you, uh, what my suggestion in the book is that you you know, you're meditating, try one and see what happens. You're wanting to, you're just in the middle of work and you need to pause for a moment, try one and see what happens. And, and the more we can take it out of being some like precious special time and let it be just infiltrated into our day, the, the, I think the better in a sense. Yeah. Is there an example of one you could perhaps share with us just so that we can get a bit of a sense of, of what this might be, of what this might be like, Diana? Sure. Why don't we do um, one that I was kind of talking about before, just to take a moment. So, so wherever you are, if you're listening, um, of course, unless you're driving, just be careful. <laughs> but otherwise, maybe people aren't driving so much these days. <laughs> um, so just to invite you to settle back in a way that's comfortable wherever you are. And just take a breath or two. And if you want to close your eyes, you can. If that's not possible. Don't worry about it. But just, just feeling yourself present here, whether you're sitting or standing or lying down, walking. And just invite you to remember a time in your life where you felt a sense of ease, peace, well-being, this connection to yourself, to the world. And it might have been out in nature. It might have been with animals. It might have been in the midst of athletic activity or in the flow of creativity or with a dear friend. It just kind of... Let your mind recall when there was a time like that for you. And if you can't remember anything, maybe try to imagine what that might be like. And so see if you can remember the place you were at, the details, sights and smells and sounds. And now notice what your body may have felt like at that time. What did it feel like? And just allow yourself to settle in to feel the quality of presence, of well-being, of ease. Notice what that feels like and let it spread through your body and see if you can simply rest here. This quality can be here right now, bright, luminous, joyful, connected. And let's feel our feet on the ground or something concrete in your body. And you can open your eyes if and when you're ready. That's quite amazing. I literally went back to the time I had in mind. I was actually in Africa at the point I thought of. And it can feel my whole body kind of being suffused with, with those feelings I had then. It's extraordinary. That's beautiful. And, and the interesting thing is it was just kind of like a thought away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is what I tell students. Like, it's here. It's available to us. Now, usually it gets obscured, right? Because we're so identified with 
the, the it's like it's like a bright shiny sun we're totally identified with the clouds <laughs> the anxiety the fear the grief the, right but if we can just part the clouds for a moment and get a glimpse of the sun like wow it's right there for me yeah and i love i mean you're saying there it's just a thought away which it was but actually the whole thing is in my body it's actually the coming back into our bodies coming and really kind of feeling what we felt it's all it's all in ourselves we're we're holding it with us all the time and it's really easy to forget that and that's one of the things suddenly for me with my the breath work that i do with the meditation practice that i have a lot of it is about wanting to get back into the body and yeah it's so beautiful oh keep going no i was, I was just gonna say but I, what i wanted to ask you is is how important do you feel that is? I mean, so for me, it was incredibly important to be able to not just to kind of get out of my head in some ways and to get more into my body. What's, what's your perspective around that? I know I completely agree with you. This is a very embodied practice. It's not, it's not, um, it's not conceptual. It's very felt sense for people. And I say it's a thought away, meaning that we used thought to access body, essentially, right? Like that's what put you in. We just said, okay, imagine this time, you know, which is sort of a casual thing to say, but it helped you suddenly like really enter your body. Um, but I totally agree with you. It's a very embodied practice. It feels very visceral. And just being able to drop into it. I, I just want to reference, there's a quote you use in the book from James Joyce, which is, um, it's from a, the story of a painful case. He lived at a little distance from his body. And I think we're really encouraged to do that in the West. We're encouraged to just be up here in our heads. And the more we can get into our bodies, for me, that, that's where a lot of the richness really comes. So I really, yeah, I, I, I really like, I don't know how many of the glimpse practices are like this, but I love this sense of being able to drop into my body and, and get present. It feels very powerful. I'm so glad. Yeah, a lot of them are about, sort of uh, like it's it, this idea of natural awareness is embodiment it's an embodiment it's not i'm thinking about this idea i mean some of them can be more cerebral but there's a number of practices that are very much like being here in this human embodiment now yeah yeah and the other thing i love in the book is that you talk about trying things for, your, for yourself and I, I read it somewhere else. You're kind of like, some of these might work for you. Some of them might not. And I think this is really important. I love this idea of not, it's not necessarily about just receiving from the guru and being told what to do. It's actually playing with it. Well, what works for me? What doesn't work for me? And suddenly with, with my clients, I feel that's really important to do that. You know, okay, let's, let's just play with it. See if it works. If it doesn't, that's fine. We'll leave it. We'll do something else. And I, I wonder what your perspective on that is. I think it's very much how I have had my own spiritual life unfold. You know, like I've, I've studied, I've had the like tremendous good fortune to study with incredible teachers over the years. And then I take what I learn and I kind of apply it to myself and figure it out. And I have that kind of mind, like, I like, I like that. I'm like, okay, does that work? No. Oh wait, this one does. And so that's how I teach. I encourage people. I want people to be almost like scientists of their own body, heart, and mind, you know, to find out, oh, this is helpful for me. And I've also, having taught for 20 years now, I know that there is no one size fit all teaching at all. And it would be very weird if there was. I mean, it's just it's impossible. People are so incredibly different. And mindfulness is not for everybody, you know, just like no medication is for everybody. Nothing works in that way. So what I encourage people to do is I'm really big on like finding what is going to work for you and then keep going and listening into your own heart and your body. And what is your body saying? Like, oh, I felt alive when I did that practice or I felt disconnected. Okay. So you follow the aliveness. <laughs> you don't follow the disconnection. Yeah. And one of the other things you talk about in the book, book is the power of intention and how you often bring intention to your practice as, as do I. And I, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about why you think intention is important as we're doing our practices. Well, intention is kind of the foundation in some sense of our practice. Like, like, 
I mean, I think of it in a couple of different ways. Sometimes I think about like, what is my motivation for doing the practice and just really rigorously examine that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that motivation is very connected to not just my own personal waking up, but also the world at large, that, that what work I can do internally can help transform my relationships and the communities and neighborhoods that I'm part of and the institutions and impact a larger larger structures and and so for me having my practice connected to that is very really really important um, and then using my mindfulness to really continually assess my motivation and, and check in on myself why did you do that okay what was that about getting clearer and clearer so that I feel like I'm acting in more ethical ways in the world yeah it's very powerful I wanted to talk a little bit more about, I guess, the crazy world that we're in at the moment, this world of, of, you know, of COVID and how you think that mindfulness can help us maintain our health right now. Why is, why is mindfulness a useful practice for us um, to, to, I guess, to keep going and to, to thrive rather than just surviving in this world? What's important about it for you? I feel deeply grateful that I have a mindfulness practice during this time and it is what's helping me get through, among other things. But um, I have also found that many people are seeking out mindfulness in this time because we're looking for mental health strategies and coping strategies. And so we've gotten at our center, there's been a lot of interest with people who want to try it, maybe who hadn't considered it before, but are feeling like I need something like this. So, um, so mindfulness can offer a number of different things. And one thing that it can offer is a, a, a very big thing is the tools for working with our emotions. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of mindfulness teachings that are how do we be present in the midst of fear and grief and uncertainty and, and um, loss and anger and all that. So, so this set of tools is, is so helpful. That's the first way that I've been seeing the mindfulness movement contributing. And um, another way is, is this quality we were talking about earlier when I was talking about equanimity and my, my, you know, that whole conversation we had before about how do we have the capacity to hold what is happening because it's like overwhelming to the system. If you just, you know, spend a lot of time reading the news, that's it. <laughs> we're, just, we're just like overwhelmed. So how do we build up that, that um, the, the, this capacity to hold even the unthinkable, you know, mm -hmm. and we can through these practices, because as you do a mindfulness practice, you're sitting in the midst of all this change, including really hard stuff at times, and you learn to be present and open to this and, you know, and be with each mosquito as it arises. So those are two important things. I think that capacity, like to further that there's like this opening to uncertainty that mm -hmm. we learn through the practice that we don't have to know the answer to everything that we can live more in a place of of this these these liminal spaces where we don't have to have everything solved and figured out and that we can be okay in those places and that's really hard but it is it is something we can learn and and then maybe I mean of course there's many many things but the last one that's coming to mind is the way in which mindfulness fosters compassion for ourselves and others and I think right now people need to be super compassionate with themselves and of course uh, cultivate more and more for the world. So. Yeah. That was one of the things that was coming to my mind is this, the, the compassion we spoke about previously and this, the, you know, the, when the world feels so threatening and, and actually in, in a way that we can't control, we've, we're, you know, we don't have, we can't control things in the way that perhaps we'd normally like to being able to hold that compassion for ourselves and go, it's okay if I'm not, on top form every day the world's crazy and maybe this person isn't behaving the way i'd like them to behave but perhaps if i can view that with some compassion that that has to be that has to be a helpful thing i think yeah i constantly i'm talking to parents telling them to please please stop being hard on yourself right now <laughs> suddenly we're supposed to be school teachers working parents and and it's like no you will fail like we've all failed okay let that one go <laughs> you're not a failure you're not a failure parent you are doing an incredible job in this challenging horrible time 
Absolutely. And you mentioned that you're getting people coming to you kind of who've never tried mindfulness before and sort of saying, I'm, I'm interested. What can I do? How do I get started? So what would you suggest to people if they want to start a practice? What would you suggest? I, um, I like to start people off really simply because if you say you should meditate for an hour, it's never going to happen. So I start people with five minutes a day and five minutes a day. Everybody has time for five minutes and I hope. Um, but it was, so I, I recommend using audio recordings. Uh, we have a, an app called UCLA mindful. It's also all over meditation. So on our website, but of course there's countless wonderful apps out there, but somebody who's helping guide you through. So you're not feeling like you're doing it all by yourself or, um, you know, classes like now, right now our center is offering lots and lots of virtual classes where you can be anywhere in the world and so anyone can access those anyone, anyone can, can access that. I, could, I don't have to be in the u.s okay absolutely we have a course called mindful awareness practices which is our basic like six-week introduction to mindfulness and at the end of that people will have created a daily practice they will learn how to work with difficult emotions they'll learn how to cultivate more compassion for themselves and others so there's a lot of skills that come out at the end of those six weeks um, if you're practicing, you want to try it at home. It, it's just to to the, the simplicity of what we're doing. The way we just start is noticing something that's happening in the present moment, like our breath, the rising and falling of our abdomen, our chest, or the air moving through our nose. And then we stay with that. We try to stay at sustain attention, but then our attention wanders. Yes. And of course our attention wanders because that means that's what human minds do. They wander. And so there's a moment where you'll notice it. And then you just gently bring your attention back to your breath. And that's the very, very basis of this practice. And it gets a little more nuanced from there. So if, as people are sort of starting this and practicing often, you know, there are moments when it's challenging and people find it difficult to maintain the practice. Is there anything you'd recommend to help people stay on track just to make things a little bit smoother and easier? Anything that, that else that you learned along the way that you think actually this is a useful tip that I share with a lot of the people I teach that they find helpful? It's important uh, not to get discouraged if you, like a lot of people think that they're not doing it right if their minds are thinking. I think there's something out there in the ether popular understanding that if you meditate your mind's supposed to go blank and that doesn't happen to most people. So if you or pretty much to anybody if you were meditating and you're finding yourself lost in thoughts that's part of the process we're learning we're, it's like we're building a muscle. And that muscle is getting stronger over time. And as many times as you wander away, you have the opportunity to bring it back. And that's something actually we used to say to the, the ADHD um, patients. We would say like, hey, you have more, more opportunity than anybody to teach your mind to come back. You're going to have the strongest muscles ever because <laughs> your mind is wandering like crazy, right? So, um, so, so the first is a not, it's not to be uh, – is is to be really gentle with yourself and not so judgmental of your practice and just keep trying. And it, it, like any habit, it's hard to do. It's not like you can say, okay, start meditating. I mean, if I say, okay, go to the gym every day, do it. People, you know what happens. So finding support around this is helpful. And that's why the apps and classes and things like that. Being are in a quite group and a community of people that can, as you said, that can be really helpful to keep, yeah keep the motivation to share what's happening. Yeah, that sounds really helpful. Excellent, okay. And are there any, anything people should be aware of from a sort of safety perspective, anything that people should, you know, should just be thinking about if they are planning to start a practice? Uh, for the most part, it's pretty much, I would say most people are, are can do this practice and there's there's not a lot of risk the only thing would be if you have some kind of um, mental health diagnosis you may want to be in contact with a professional as you do it just to make sure and that's probably more for like more of the severe diagnoses than the kind of and, and, and you know the kind of more uh midline but but what i would say is 
for instance, as someone who's very, very, very depressed, trying to do mindfulness is probably going to be a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like you need to get your head out of the water a little bit, whether that's through with therapy and medication and so forth, and then give it a try. It tends to be more accessible to people who have, who have not like severe uh, mental health concerns. Okay. And what about if somebody wants to teach, you founded the International Mindfulness Teachers Association. So if somebody decided that actually they've had a practice for a while, they would perhaps like to be sharing this with, with other people, what would make a good kind of foundation or groundwork for them, for them, do you think? Well, at this point, there's lots of teacher training programs out there. So I do recommend it that if you to get into most teacher training programs, not all, or the accredited ones, you have to have had a meditation practice for a number of years mm -hmm. and done some um, retreat practice, meaning going into like, you know, a period of time, whether five days or more. Um, so we have a, we have a program at UCLA, the training and mindfulness facilitation, and people go through a year program of learning to be a teacher, but there's many programs out there that are really wonderful that give you the foundation that you need and the peer support and the confidence and supervision so the, i think i i really do recommend it um that we developed the international mindfulness teachers association because the field is so young and there were the concern i mean this is the concern the concern is that you can some people there are people out there who just do a weekend workshop in mindfulness and then suddenly put out a shingle and say that they're a mindfulness teacher and no one would really do this it, 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 mindfulness is deceptively simple people think it's just oh just pay attention to the present moment but it's it's an embodied practice as we're talking about and the best teachers are the teachers who have years and years of personal experience who then embody it and use it creatively because it's coming from within them as opposed to just like reading a book or going to a workshop and then teaching it. So because the field is unregulated, um, that was why the International Mindfulness Teachers Association arose. And now we're creating best practices and standards and professionalizations and professionalization for the, for the field. And for like, you know, a 200 hour program, you, you can then get certified and you have this, this uh, uh, association, this affiliation. It's, so it's really, um, I think it's really, really important for the field to maintain the integrity of what we're doing out there. Absolutely, to have that rigor around. And I mean, this is, I think it's often about holding that container for the people you're working with. If you haven't had that deep embodied practice yourself, it's very hard for you to, you know, things can come up for people, can't they? And if you haven't experienced it yourself, it's going to be much harder to hold that container and make it safe for the people you're working with, I think. So sounds like really really good work that you're doing i wanted to ask you about how you keep things fresh for yourself you've been doing this for a long time um what kind of you know do, do, is there ongoing learning what sort of things do you do to to keep it fresh and meaningful and powerful for yourself diana hmm. Well, I think life makes it fresh, <laughs> you know, like, like um, I've certainly over 30 years of practice gotten into ruts and sort of gotten like tired of this or that. And then something shifts. And, you know, like, for instance, when I had my daughter, which was she's 11 now, and, and I had like, I had a kind of I'm such a good practitioner and then boom, I have this baby and then this child who's, you know, challenging me and I've had to learn how to bring my practice into that. And that certainly has kept it fresh and it always is fresh each day with, with, um, with a kid. Um, so learn, but learning what it means to integrate mindfulness and embodied practice into being a parent, you know, learning how to, um, how do I meditate when I haven't slept all night and when, or she's up at, oh, she's, she's keeping me up at night. So that's my meditation time and how interesting. And I just get to be here in the stillness with this infant when she's little or so, so there's that or the freshness of what does it mean to teach in this time of COVID? What does it mean to teach? What are my teachings going to be like in this time of social unrest that's happening, particularly in the U.S., right? So, so it's really challenging me. It's really challenging me to look at my own internalized racism and to dismantle the racism in me so that I can be a better teacher and, and supporter and ally as a white person in, um, in the role that I play in the leadership role. So, so I feel like I'm always 
learning and growing and um and it's yeah it's such a great question because there's it's like wow life is one big one big learn and i'm just giving you little snippets here but yeah but what's your what's your approach to that if you are try, as you say given given everything that's going on in the world and that there's many different sort of dynamics now happening how how do you I guess get a bit of a handle on that for yourself in terms of thinking about well which which approach do I want to take how how do I want to think about this how do I want to reflect on this is there anything you can share um, are you talking specifically I'm not sure I understand the question like like just with everything that's happening around you mentioned sort of the the looking at your own racism and that that side of things yeah. i'm curious as to as to how you how you frame it to yourself in terms of how do i learn from this how do i grow and develop my you know, myself my practice from this yeah yeah so it's something that um that has been an ongoing um exploration for decades for me and um looking at the way that uh, uh, like oppression manifests within me mm -hmm. my own inner racism classism sexism gender you know all of that is 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 like in, embedded in being like a human being in these cultural conditions in this time and so one of the interesting things that mindfulness has given me is um it, it gives me a tool to explore what's happening in my internal world mm -hmm. in a very like non judgmental and loving and compassionate way. So there's been some very interesting research looking at how mindfulness can impact implicit bias, right? So implicit bias, the like that snap judgments that we make the blind spots that we have, but that mindfulness actually can reduce implicit bias based reactions. And so I feel like this tool of using of when I see my own um, fear arising, my own white fragility, my own um, my own you know thoughts that, like that are replicating racist or or sexist or classist structures inside me, that I can notice it, I can name it, I can bring compassion to myself, I can hold it in this space, and I feel like. Like the work is very, very profound and very hard. It's really, it's very challenging. And it's not the only thing to do because there's also like the larger structures that need to be dismantling, not just dismantling our own inner racism, but it's the bigger, it's the bigger picture that is really needed. But it, 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 it I think this helps it's just one piece of the puzzle um the inner work that we can do around this and so much it has to start with ourselves if we're not willing to look at it in ourselves then it's going to be very hard for us to then go out and actually make change in the wider world and i think i think you're right that possibility of sitting and creating a, a, a small amount of awareness and distance between what's going on and observing and then saying well what does what comes up for me what does that mean for me how how do i want to work with that it's really powerful Absolutely. So we're coming towards the end of our time together, Diana, and I just um, had a couple more questions for you. So firstly, what is your, what's your vision for the future? Where do you want to see mindfulness going in the future? Um, people practicing natural awareness, what, what's your vision? I, my hope is that mindfulness can be um, more and more integrated into people's lives in a way that it's not seen as something like unusual or alternative or cutting edge, but it becomes like a foundation of how people operate in the world so that it's, it's, and this is already happening in many ways. It's being taught in schools. It's being taught and in, brought into hospitals and to, businesses and like it like it's like but but i think in the united states it's probably a very um east coast west coast phenomenon and not it's it's more like urban centers and yeah. then it is as a like as a whole and but i feel like these tools are so tremendously valuable that it would be helpful to be incorporated into institutions and 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 also 
like I asked this question, like how can it contribute to the healing of this planet? Mm. You know, how can it, and, and some of it is like what we're talking about right now, this, this, this mental health solution, like it's one of, one of many mental health solutions that can help people to hold, to hold this, this like what's happening right now in this world. And so the more it's integrated, it's part of the culture and the world. I, I think we're going to be the better off and, can it be brought more to frontline workers right now during COVID? Can it be brought to politicians? Yes. Can indeed. it be brought, you know, in, in um, I know they're doing incredible stuff in England right now, in the UK with the National Health Service mm -hmm. bringing mindfulness in. So I'd like to see more and more of that. And um, anyway, that's what comes to me right now. Yeah. Perfect. And where can people find you online if they want to, if they want to find out more about what you're doing, where's the best place for them to, to look? So two places, the uclahealth.org slash mark. So that's our mindful awareness research center website. And then I have my own site, dianawinston.com. And I'm on a couple of different apps. So you can find me on our UCLA mindful app and the 10% happier app. And I'm going to be doing some stuff with the Waking Up app. So I'm in, I'm around <laughs> quite a bit. And then my book is The Little Book of Being. And that's available wherever books are sold. And I also have a couple of other books, including Fully Present, The Science, Art and Practice of Mindfulness, which I co-wrote with a scientist. Fantastic. There's some great resources there for people to, um, to look at and find out some more. And I guess the last thing is just, do you have any last comments, thoughts, anything else you'd like to share about mindfulness, about the body, anything else that you just wanted to leave people with as a last thought? Okay. Um, well, first of all, one more thing I want to remember to, to tell people most Thursdays at uh, Pacific standard time, 1230, I have a free meditation that anybody can join on, on Zoom. So that's a, another uh, resource for you. But your question is, anything I want to leave people with? Um, maybe just end with the one last practice. That How would about be that? lovely. Yeah, okay. that would be really nice. So wherever you are, just to settle back again, taking a breath or two. <sighs> And see if you can notice what's happening for you. Like what's happening in my body right now? There is heaviness and weight and lightness and tingling and warmth. There might be comfort or discomfort. See if you can let whatever is here be here. Just allowing it to be exactly as it is. And breathe and soften. And then notice what's happening in your heart area or your emotions. Are you feeling happy at rest? Maybe there's some anxiety or loss or sadness or what is here? Just checking in. Sometimes nothing's happening, but letting making space for whatever is here. We can have the capacity to hold this. We really can. And if you notice your thoughts, is there a particular mental activity happening? Allowing whatever is here to be here. And so here we are embodied in our emotions in this body here, this in our heart, in our mind, resting, softening, just being. And let's think of all of the people around the world who are in need of this place of fundamental well-being, of embodiment, of kindness and compassion. And just offer a sense of kindness out into the world. 
a world that so deeply needs compassion right now. Take one breath. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And here we are. What a lovely way to end a podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Dan, it was really lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for, for coming and, and speaking to me today. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you again at the Embodiment Conference. So it's a real pleasure. That would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you for all your great questions and for your presence. Right. Thank you.